You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com In our time, it is broadly true that political writing is bad writing. Where it is not true, it will generally be found that the writer is some kind of rebel, expressing his private opinions and not a party line. Orthodoxy, of whatever color, seems to demand a lifeless, imitative style. Political dialects to be found in pamphlets, leading articles, manifestos, white papers, and the speeches of undersecretaries do, of course, vary from party to party, but they are all alike in that one almost never finds in them a fresh, vivid, homemade turn of speech. When one watches some tired hack on the platform, mechanically repeating the familiar phrases, bestial atrocities, iron heel, blood-stained tyranny, free peoples of the world, stand shoulder to shoulder. One often has a curious feeling that one is not watching a live human being, but some kind of dummy. A feeling which suddenly becomes stronger at moments when the light catches the speaker's spectacles and turns them into blank discs, which seem to have no eyes behind them. And this is not altogether fanciful. A speaker who uses that kind of phraseology has gone some distance toward turning himself into a machine. The appropriate noises are coming out of his larynx, but his brain is not involved, as it would be if he were choosing his words for himself. If the speech he is making is one that he is accustomed to make over and over again, he may be almost unconscious of what he is saying, as one is when one utters the responses in church. And this reduced state of consciousness, if not indispensable, is at any rate favorable to political conformity. In our time, political speeches and writing are largely the defense of the indefensible. Things like the continuance of British rule in India, the Russian purges and deportations, the dropping of the atom bombs on Japan, can indeed be defended, but only by arguments which are too brutal for most people to face, and which do not square with the professed aims of the political parties. Thus political language has to consist largely of euphemism, question-begging, and sheer cloudy vagueness. Defenseless villages are bombarded from the air, the inhabitants driven out into the countryside, the cattle machine-gunned, the huts set on fire with incendiary bullets. This is called pacification. Millions of peasants are robbed of their farms and sent trudging along the roads with no more than they can carry. This is called transfer of population, or rectification of frontiers. People are imprisoned for years without trial, or shot in the back of the neck, or sent to die of scurvy in Arctic lumber camps. This is called Elimination of unreliable elements. Such phraseology is needed if one wants to name things without calling up mental pictures of them. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Corbett Report podcast. I am your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan, here on this 14th day of June 2019. This is episode 357 of the Corbett Report podcast, Language is a weapon. And bonus points to any of you listening to the audio version of this podcast, or any blind people listening to the video version of this podcast, who correctly identified the source of today's opening quotation without aid of visual prompt or cue, namely our good old friend Eric Arthur Blair, aka George Orwell, in his 1946 essay on politics and the English language. And yes, I have observed numerous times that it's difficult to go so much as a single podcast anymore without raising the specter of George Orwell or using that uh, ubiquitous adjective of our age, Orwellian. But uh, So I will get it out of the way immediately. But in this case, not in the familiar context of 1984 in the Big Brother police state, but in this case on Eric Blair's more philosophical ruminations on politics and language. And as I often observe, this is the one thing that I'm actually qualified to talk about, because we all know that you need a some sort of qualification from an accredited institution to be able to talk on anything. So 
don't worry, I have a couple of degrees, literally, <laughs> literally junked in the back of my bookshelf somewhere, I should dig it out before the end of this episode, that show that I am qualified to talk about this subject. And unfortunately, although I begin with a little opening jest, it is not a jesting matter. This is, this is no laughing matter, because language is a weapon, and although that is an analogy that is a metaphor, I think there is a reality to that metaphor, in fact, a very literal reality. What do I refer to? Well, let's take an example from modern history, um, something a little bit closer to our time than 1946 and George Orwell's time, and let's look at the Atlantic.com from May 29th of 2012. Under Obama, men killed by drones are presumed to be terrorists. Which reads, in part, quote, after interviewing dozens of current and former White House advisors, the New York Times breaks a lot of news in its story on President Obama's secret kill list. Remember that? Perhaps none of it more jaw-dropping than new details describing how the U.S. now calculates the number of innocents killed by our drones. What innovative method did our Nobel Peace Prize winning president implement? It, in effect, counts all military-age males in strike zones as combatants, according to several administration officials, unless there is explicit intelligence posthumously proving them innocent, the newspaper reports. Counter-terrorism officials insist this approach is one of simple logic. People in an area of known terrorist activity or found with a top Al-Qaeda operative are probably up to no good. For those tracing Obama's career arc, we've gone from his assistant insistence as a U.S. senator that it would be unjust to try accused terrorists in a military tribunal with an attorney to his judgment as president that if one member of al-Qaeda is someplace, every guy in vague physical proximity automatically meets the convenient innocent until probably up to no good standard. Well, the article goes on from there and elaborates in greater detail, but this is an example of words actually conjuring a real judic judicial reality that takes an actual reality on the ground that means people die. People die because they are in the physical proximity of somebody who has been labeled a terrorist and thereby they are labeled by extinction, probably up to no good, given the enemy combatant label and made a valid target of drone warfare and killed. Real, true warfare being waged on the back of words that are being applied in certain situations. Words can kill. In this case, in a very real and literal sense. Language is a weapon. This is not a game. This is not a laugh. This is not some abstract philosophical point. It's something that actually has some real resonance and meaning. And that was what George Orwell was writing about 60, 70 years ago. It is something that obviously has still continues to have very real meaning for us in this age of the war of terror. So to bring that point home and to bring it a little bit closer to the present, I'm going to turn to a conversation that I had several years ago uh, with Andrew Gavin Marshall, who I note I don't believe seems to be online anymore, or I haven't seen much trace of him in the last several years, but at any rate, he is a previous CorporateReport.com guest. He was one of the guests in Century of Enslavement, my Federal Reserve documentary, and I did have him on Corporate Report Radio a few times, including in Corporate Report Radio episode 186 on politics and language, where we discussed, in particular, Orwell's essay and its relevance to our own day and age. And uh, once again, just an absolutely incredible essay. I hope it, for people out there who haven't read it yet, I hope they do so. But uh, what what does that say to our own current political day and age? Uh, from from my own money, I think the more things change, the more they stay the same. But uh, but Andrew, your take on that? Oh, well, that's just what I was thinking. I mean, the uh, population transfer pacification, these are terms that are still used today. And that essay was written in 1946, I believe. Um, so you have... Uh, like you said, some things, you know, don't change. And uh, that use of political language, I mean, Orwell was talking about a declining British Empire. When I think of those words today, I think of the declining American Empire. Uh, because the same terminology is, in fact, used uh, throughout the American Empire. Uh, if you look at even, uh, for example, um, defining terrorists, defining freedom fighters, um, you know, for example, the Contras, in Nicaragua, uh, these were, you know, uh, by any, these were death squads, essentially. Um, drug money funded, uh, terrorist outfits trained by the CIA. These were, in the words of Ronald Reagan, uh, freedom fighters. They were fighting for what we called democracy, which meant dictatorship. 
Um, and you look at the same thing with Libya today. I mean, uh, or last year, it was the uh, democratic uprising. There was nothing democratic about it. Um, these were freedom fighters, uh, liberators. Um, the fact that they were, uh, by and large, militant, Al-Qaeda-linked uh, terrorist outfits uh, is irrelevant because those are facts. They are uh, the freedom fighters of Libya and so that's what you refer to them as because that creates the imagery uh, that you desire. And even if you just look at uh, when the Egypt uprising was beginning and the power structure in the United States was not yet sure uh, how to approach the situation entirely, uh, you had Hillary Clinton making statements uh, calling for calm on both sides. What exactly does that mean? You know, you have a ruthless repression, a violent repression of a population out in a square who are armed basically with rocks. But Hillary Clinton is calling for calm on both sides. That frames the imagery of, uh, you know, both sides are making mistakes and having faults. Whereas, well, you compare that to Syria today and you're not hearing for calling for calm on both sides. You're arming one side against the other. So it changes. It's, I mean, it's, you could call it hypocritical, but that implies that it has the possibility to not be hypocritical. It's like claiming that the United States uh, lies. It assumes that it has the ability to tell the truth. You can't really uh, state that your political leaders are lying because, again, I, I, it's hard to imagine a case in which they don't. That's just the way things function. Um, it's like accusing you know, an infant of lying. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really make sense, but it's all about the imagery that is constructed in these situations. And you, again, Bahrain, you look at Bahrain, there's not even discussion on Bahrain and what's happening there. So it's not merely a matter of being hypocritical. It's a matter of how you frame the imagery. Uh, and that's done through language, as you said. And uh, it changes from place to place, but really the game is all the same. So we have George Orwell back in 1946, pending politics in the English language, to make the point that language can be twisted and used as a weapon against the populace by politicians, and I would add parenthetically their puppet masters, by deploying euphemisms and other things to smooth over certain atrocities and violence and other things that cannot be mentioned in polite society and should not be mentioned by those seeking to gain approval from the electorate or the populace generally. So, they twist language and use it as a weapon. And of course, that fundamental principle certainly still applied several years ago when Andrew Gavin Marshall and myself had that conversation, and it self-evidently still applies to this day. In fact, as we pointed out, many of the exact same terms that Orwell was pointing out are still used in the same way to euphemistically refer to things that cannot be referred to, to to this very day, and we can add any number to that list, and if you go and listen to the rest of that conversation, uh, Corbett Report Radio 186, you'll see we do discuss some more terms that are used in exactly that, uh, that fashion today. Um, Parenthetically, I will note that uh, Corp Report Radio 186 seems to have disappeared off of YouTube. I really don't know what happened to that particular episode, but I will be uploading it to my BitChute and DTube channels uh, over the course of the weekend or early next week, and I will be posting it up on the front page in case you happen to miss that conversation several years ago. I think it's worth re-watching or re-listening to. Um, but on that note, uh, as I say, this is... I hope that it's starting to hit home, that this is a very real phenomenon with very real-world consequences. This isn't highfalutin, philosophical, abstract nonsense. No, these are real concepts that are being wielded as weapons against the populace and being used to drive us into war or to drive us towards this or that goal of the erstwhile would-be engineers of society. And if you do need Yet another example of exactly how this is done. An excellent example comes from previous Corbett Report guest, Douglas Valentine, who, in his book on the Phoenix Program, outlined in great detail how, in the counterinsurgency operations of the U.S. military, language was used as a weapon uh, and was weaponized specifically in order to wage that type of counterinsurgency war against the Vietnamese people. 
In its broadest political warfare application, language is the means by which governments, through subtle suggestion and disinformation, shape public opinion on issues. Communists and capitalists alike recognize the power of slogans and packaging to sell political as well as commercial products. For example, the Viet Cong used language to peddle a totalitarian state in the guise of social justice, while language allowed Ed Lansdale to wrap the Diem dictatorship in the robe of Jesus Christ and sell it as a democracy. The difference in Vietnam, of course, was that the Viet Cong slung their slogans at the rural population, proclaiming, Land for the Landless, while Lansdale, who prior to World War II handled accounts for an advertising agency in San Francisco, declared straight-faced that Christ has moved south, a pitch obviously aimed at the American public. Lansdale was not unaware of what he was doing. The first objective of a covert action program is to create plausible denial, specifically in South Vietnam to cloak the CIA's role in organizing GVN repression. The CIA did this by composing and planting distorted articles in foreign and domestic newspapers and by composing official communiques which appear to have originated within the GVN itself. This disinformation campaign led predisposed Americans to believe that the GVN was a legitimately elected representative government, a condition which was a necessary prerequisite for the massive aid programs that supported the CIA's covert action programs. Insofar as language, information management, perpetuated the myth that Americans were the GVN's advisors, not its manufacturer, public support was rallied for continued intervention. Next, the CIA judges a covert action program on its intelligence potential, its ability to produce information on the enemy's political, military, and economic infrastructure. That is why the CIA's covert action branch operates as an intelligence arm under cover of civic action. What makes these intelligence operations covert is not any mistaken impression on the part of the enemy, but rather the CIA's ability to deny plausibly involvement in them to the American public. Here again, language is the key. For example, during Senate hearings into CIA assassination plots against Fidel Castro and other foreign leaders, plausible denial was defined by the CIA's Deputy Director of Operations, Richard Bissell, as the use of circumlocution and euphemism in discussions where precise definitions would expose covert actions and bring them to an end. The Church Committee report says, In November 1962, the proposal for a new covert action program to overthrow Castro was developed. The president's assistant, Richard Goodwin, and General Edward Lansdale, who was experienced in counterinsurgency operations, played major staff roles in creating this program, which was named Operation Mongoose. A special group was created to oversee Mongoose, and Lansdale was made its chief of operations. Those operations included executive actions. A memo written by Lansdale and introduced during the hearings in part states that the attack on the cadre of the regime, including key leaders, should be a special target operation. CIA defector operations are vital here. Gangster elements might prove the best recruitment potential for actions against police G2 officials. When questioned about his language, Lansdale testified that the words actions and attack actually meant killing. He also testified that criminal elements were contracted for use in the attack against Castro. He euphemistically called these gangsters the Caribbean Survey Group. Further to ensure plausible denial, the CIA conducts covert action under cover of proprietary companies like Air America and the Freedom Company through veterans and business organizations and various other fronts. As in the case of fake newspaper articles and official communiques, the idea is to use disinformation to suggest initiatives fostering positive values, freedom, patriotism, brotherhood, democracy, while doing dirty deeds behind the scenes. In CIA jargon, this is called black propaganda and is the job of political and psychological PP officers in the covert action branch. PP officers played a major role in packaging Phoenix for sale to the American public as a program designed to protect the people from terrorism. Once again, Douglas Valentine, The Phoenix Program, a highly recommended book about a very dark chapter of American history that does deserve to be more well-known than it is. But I think you get a flavor of at least some of the psychological operations that were waged specifically by and through and within the realm of language, language itself being wielded as a weapon 
again, I hope the point, the fundamental point that I'm trying to drive home here is by this point well understood. So let's start elaborating and exploring that point and see how we can potentially wield this weapon ourselves or at any rate uh, arm ourselves against such a weapon. And in order to do so, we're going to turn to an interesting source, one that actually is name-dropped and name-checked by none other than Orwell himself in that essay on politics in the English language. You'll note that towards the end of the essay, he name-checks Stuart Chase and admonishes him and his ilk for saying that all political language and even terms like fascism and communism and what have you are themselves fluffy, airy nonsense and thus should be dismissed because they don't have a real referent. Well, and he admonishes Stuart Chase specifically for the type of political quietism that such a, a philosophy leads to. And I think there is a point there, um, but I don't know if that's necessarily a completely accurate characterization of Stuart Chase's fundamental point. And I know because I actually did read Stuart Chase's book uh, that Orwell is uh, tangentially referring to there, uh, The Tyranny of Words, which was published in 1938. And it is an interesting book. And I went into that book with no other information than it was about the tyranny of words and that it was written in 1938 by someone named Stuart Chase, and I had no biographical details. And I'm glad I didn't, because it turns out Stuart Chase <laughs> was a certainly some form, some stripe of socialist, and uh, I believe a card-carrying technocrat in the 1930s who wrote an apologia for technoc uh, technocracy, Inc. later on, when Howard Scott was determined to be a charlatan and all of that. So um, someone on, uh, on uh, the opposite side of the ideological field of play than myself, I would say, quite obviously, for people who keep up with the, the podcast. But I'm glad I didn't know that, and that didn't cloud my perception of the reading of this book. I didn't look up the biographical details of Stuart Chase until after the book, and I'm glad I didn't, because it didn't cloud my perception of this book. There, It is an interesting book, making some very important points about politics and language, and how language can be used and abused and misused. Um, and uh, obviously I disagree with Stuart Chase on certain points, but on other points I think he makes some very valid points. Some very uh, uh, nicely down-to-earth points in a very straightforward way. This can be a very philosophical and abstract sort of area for people, but I think Stuart Chase brings it down to brass tacks, which is exactly, I think, the point of his book, The Tyranny of Words. And... Uh, and Although it, the, I think the idea, the, the semantic ideas that were being developed by Chase and others in that time period have since developed in, and are probably more well-known as part of the post-structuralist philosophy and, and all of that. Um, but it, in this early stage, it, it's very, I think, understandable, even by a lay audience, or I'd like to believe. Um, so let's, let's devour a little bit of this book and get into the nuts and bolts of what it is that Stuart Chase was driving at and why it's important and what it can tell us about how we can wield this weapon differently than the way that the tyrants would wish to wield it against us. Um, specifically, let's start by just getting a handle on this book and, and one of its main continuing driving th themes that you'll find throughout the book. And in order to do that, we'll quote from a little section in uh, chapter two, A Look Around the Modern World, in which Stuart Chase writes, quote, it is too late to eliminate the factor of sheer verbalism in this already blazing war between fascism and communism. That war may end Europe as a viable continent for decades. To say that it is a battle of words alone is contrary to the facts, for there are important differences between the so-called fascist and communist states. But the words themselves, and the dialectic which accompanies them, have kindled emotional fires which far transcend the differences in fact. Abstract terms are personified to become burning, fighting realities. Yet if the knowledge of semantics were general, and men were on guard for communication failure, the conflagration could hardly start. There would be honest differences of opinion, there might be a sharp political struggle, but not this windy clash of rival metaphysical notions. If one is attacked and cornered, one fights. The reaction is shared with other animals and is a sound survival mechanism. In modern times, however, this natural action comes after the conflict has been set in motion by propaganda. Bad language is now the mightiest weapon in the arsenal of despots and demagogues. End quote. Yes, a nice, succinct way of putting the argument, and it is an argument that is greatly elaborated on in this voluminous book that uh, looks at many different ways in which 
uh, language is misused and abused and otherwise misapplied in various situations, uh, social and economic and judicial and many other contexts as well, but of course, political. Um, the political context obviously being one of the key ways in which language can be misused. And uh, and this isn't just a slight, oh, oops, oops, we kind of misused a word here or there. No, th along the lines of Orwell and politics and the English language and the other concepts we've been discussing, no, it can be wielded as a weapon against entire swaths of the globe. How so? Well, let's turn uh, now to uh, chapter 18, Stroll with the Statesman, again from The Tyranny of Words from 1938 by Stuart Chase, where he writes, quote, I ask you to think of Germany, and what do you see? An area colored yellow or green, the British Empire was usually red, on a map in your school geography. This is your chief visible referent. Germany has geographical reality, although its boundaries make little topographical sense and are sometimes shifted. The other measurable referent is the native population living in this area, men, women, and children. They can be counted. Their characteristics, however, are astronomical in complexity and variation. Some of these people compose the German government, and one person makes the major political decisions. A topographical section, a file of people or a group of officials, is not, however, the personified nation commonly used in language. The latter is something impressively more, an essence, a might, a will, and so a goblin. Observations in the area disclose nothing corresponding to such an essence. They disclose Schmidt 1, Schmidt 2, Schmidt 3, going about their business if they have any, or kicking their heels in an employment office if they have none. Germany may have gone mad in 1914 and again in 1933, as excited commentators say, but the organic madness is in the realms of demonology, not in the area called Germany. You yourself recognize this when you say, the German people are decent, kindly folk in the main, but Germany... If Germany, in terms of real reference, does thus and so, then you must be prepared to see every person in the population with a heave-ho like sailors on a rope doing thus and so. Germany chokes freedom. Well, all together now, choke! But if all together, who is left to be choked? The cows, perhaps? Or an American newspaperman in Berlin? Well, some persons called Germans are choking the activities of other Germans, correct. The German government as a group of officials is doing some choking, yes. But Germany is not doing any choking, no. When you get away from Germany and begin to think about Schmidt 1, the fog begins to lift. In any country in so-called Western civilization, you will find most people eating, sleeping, laughing, talking, going to market, rearing children, working in factories, tilling the soil, reading newspapers, attending concerts, games and moving pictures, riding in railroad trains and motor cars, a good deal as most people are doing in the next country. Some people in Germany today are performing certain acts of which I disapprove. But I find many people in the area called America performing acts of which I also disapprove. Mr. Hurst, for instance. William Randolph Hearst, obviously. Are there relatively more of such actions in Germany? I believe there are. But I confess my inventory is not complete. At this point, intelligent criticism can take place, but not in the foggy realms of a mad Germany." End quote. Now, I hope a passage like that, although it seems perhaps plainly obvious, perhaps so plainly obvious that it doesn't need to be stated on one level, on the other hand, uh, quite the contrary, very much needs to be restated over and over, constantly, in front of everybody, and not, of course, just in the context of Germany in the 1914 or 1930, but in terms of whatever propaganda we are being assailed with on any given day of the week, whether it's about those dastardly Syrians or those dastardly Iranians, or those wonderful Saudis who crucify and behead people in public, but that's okay because they're our friends. No, we have to keep in mind that when we are using these terms, these reference, they are not referring to specific things. They're being thrown like a blanket over entire geographical swaths of the globe in order to categorize and thus neatly tie in a bow whatever geopolitical agenda is attempting to be forwarded by the person speaking. And again, I, I think this does need underlining and reaffirming. And specifically because, as listeners of this podcast will know from, say, episode 350 of this podcast on History is Written by the Winners, or episode 347, 348, 349 on World War I Conspiracy, you will know that there were decades of preparation of the English psyche, in particular, at that time, for 
the uh, the uh, what would eventually uh, eventuate into World War One, the the battle, the conquest against those evil warlike Huns. There was decades of preparation to convince the English public and the public in other countries besides of the dastardly evil, inherently warlike nature of the Germans and Germany, perhaps best exemplified and personified by their head of state, that wild, bloodthirsty demon, Kaiser Wilhelm, who, again, you will know from episode 350, for example, was not exactly the warmongering, bloodthirsty demon he was portrayed as in the literature of the time. Although, certainly no angel, but certainly not the demon that he was classified as. But even so, at least that is a person that you can talk about. And he did this and he did not do that. And there are certain objective facts you can look at. But when you talk about Germany in general, or Syria in general, or Iran in general, then there is no other thing that can be done with a sentence like that other than to forward some sort of agenda. Either to defend an entire swath of the globe and everyone within it, or to paint them all with the same brush as evil, or whatever the case may be. And we have to be on guard against that, because that is a key part of this weapon, and the way that language is wielded as a weapon. In fact, as Stuart Chase notes, one of the most powerful weapons in the arsenal of the demagogue and the tyrant. Absolutely. And again, this should be apparent from any number of different ways. But, as we are wont to observe here on the Corbett Report, weapons are generally, well, certainly swords, <laughs> many types of swords, are dual-edged. And uh, in case I'm extending this analogy too far, let's get back to brass tacks. The question is, if language can be wielded as a weapon to corral and control and coerce people into this avenue of action or that avenue of inaction or whatever the case may be, then can it be wielded by the people against the demagogues and tyrants? Can we actually use these inherent properties of words and language to shape the reality that we want? And I think the answer is most evidently yes. I think language can teach us many things about the world, even if it is not the world. And we have to keep that fundamental paradox in our heads at all times when we are dealing in the world of language. This is an important point. It really is, because there is a fundamental paradox at the heart of what language is and the way it functions. And I liken it, because all we can ever do is liken this to that, because words are not the thing. But I liken it to a terrain that we are trying to discover and map. But for whatever reason, the terrain itself is invisible. We can't see it directly. So we throw down this blanket of words on top of it to try to describe the terrain, and we see the way the words lie, and, oh, here's a hill, and here's a valley, here's a meadow, here's a forest, here's a stream. We can, we can infer the things underneath this blanket of words because we see that the way the words are lying on top. But at the same time that those words are helping us to describe and define and map that reality, it is also obscuring that reality from us. It is covering that reality, so we cannot see the reality underneath. And that is an interesting paradox, but perhaps one that might work to our advantage somehow if we know how to wield language and wield people's inability to determine, to distinguish the signifier from the signified to get all jargony on you. Uh, what do I mean in, in, in real terms? Well, I mean such things as the remarkable ability of language to convey ideas to completely different audiences. In fact, audiences that might have diametrically opposed ideas, but conveying the same idea, just using different words for each audience, and getting each audience to accept those ideas, even if they seem to be in conflict with each other. Different social context use different languages. If you're, and this goes against every piece of marketing you can ever read in an MBA. But the key here is understanding that most people just try to create a one-size-fits-all message and then broadcast that to the entire country. Well, frankly, that sucks. If if, I st if I'm standing in front of a libertarian crowd, I could say that I think it's very beneficial for the long-term economy growth that a link in the value chain can be cut out of the distribution logistics 
and therefore connect, we can connect consumers directly to producers of culture, creating new jobs in the cultural sector and long term and creating opportunities for long term growth in, in, uh, as we get rid of this dead weight in the distribution chain. If I'm talking before a Marxist crowd, and I've done that too, I would say that I think it's absolutely amazing that the cultural workers have finally assumed control of the means of production for, for their own sweat and labor and are able to cut out these parasitic profiteer middlemen who have been profiting unjustly off of their sweat. And I'm say, saying the exact same thing. Hence, language is a very powerful social marker of inclusion and of exclusion. If you're using the wrong language in a crowd, they will disagree with you no matter what you're saying. That was Rick Falkvinge uh, speaking at Republica 2012, and I hope people will know of Rick Falkvinge and know him as the uh, the leader or the the founder of the the Pirate Party uh, in Sweden. And uh, a remarkable story. And he wrote about the story of how he came to found and and bring this party to political prominence in uh, Swarmwise, uh, the tactical manual to change the world. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating story and a very interesting case study in how decentralized movements can function successfully. Um, it's, uh, again, very interesting. But in that particular case, he's making the point about how in a swarm or a decentralized uh, movement of some sort, the point is not to control the way that the, the message is forwarded to other people. No, the very point is to allow everyone within the swarm to communicate that message in their own way to different audiences because exactly as he demonstrates in that particular, uh, in, in that clip, phrasing things in different ways for different audiences will get diametrically opposed audiences to both be able to see past the all the ideological blinders that come with certain words and certain terms and see the idea and understand and internalize and accept the idea. Uh, whereas if you gave those speeches opposite, so that you gave the, the communist-infused speech to the libertarians and the libertarian-infused speech to the communists, obviously both audiences would reject the idea. But it's the same idea at base. And that is, again, part of the... Uh, the, the, the power of language to either disarm audiences or raise their hackles. And, and again, that's why there is no one-size-fits-all solution uh, towards communicating information. And that's why the unanswerable question that I get over and over and over and over and over and over and will probably continue to get <laughs> for the rest of my career is, but James, I'm trying to convince so-and-so, how do I do it? What do I say? <laughs> there is no answer to that because there is a million answers, a billion answers. And because obviously language and, and the way that ideas are introduced have to be tailored to different audiences. Now, that might smack of dissembling in some way, or maybe isn't that manipulation and deceit in the same way that the politicians are manipulating and deceiving? No, it's a recognition of the reality that language comes with baggage that you may not intend, but is there nonetheless. And you have to be mindful of the language that you're using in any particular context and know your audience and tailor your message to your audience. That's just part of the reality of language that we have to deal with. But is there anything more hopeful that we can give other than to say that we must simply be aware of the language that we're using for, for audiences and to tailor this for message for that audience? Well, that is something that I brought up with Andrew Evan Marshall back in Corbett Report Radio 186. Is there a, a positive message that we can take away from this? Is there a way that we can use the weapon of language against the would-be oppressors of humanity? But, uh, but Andrew, we've been talking about the ways that this can be used for manipulation of the population and, and suppression of the population and pulling one over on the population. Is there a counter strategy by which poli uh, political language can be used in a conscious way to actually inform people of what's happening? Is there a positive spin that people who are working in the alternative media, for example, can put on this to actually affect change in a positive way through this language? Well, I think that first of all yes there is uh, a way that it can be used to the benefit of knowledge 
to the benefit of what you could define as liberty, I guess. Um, but it really comes down to uh, an act, which is to define the language you use. It's not simply to define uh, the language being used by the elites, which is necessary. I mean, if you write a report, for example, on the European debt crisis, and it's all about austerity and adjustment uh, and what's taking place, but you don't define these terms, uh, you're not going to really be informing people. You're going to be repeating things that people can then repeat themselves. But there's no really transfer of knowledge itself or accumulation of knowledge. If you define the actual terms, and then you can go into all the details of the policies and effects, etc., but you have to actually define the terms that are used. And the same goes uh, in terms of a general alternative uh, political ideas, ideologies, um, and uh, the concept of liberation itself. I mean, the, the words that the alternative or the resistance, uh, media resistance populations, movements, uh, they have to also define their terms. And they don't really do this. Um, you hear a lot of talk of freedom or of democracy or of liberty. Uh, but again, these terms aren't properly defined when they're being used. And I think that that's a way to really expand the debate within the alternative media and between uh, radical or revolutionary ideas and philosophies. I mean, just for example, uh, if you were to have a, theor a hypothetical debate between an anarchist and a, an American libertarian, um, but you didn't define the term freedom, uh, the debate would be nonsense because the anarchist has a specific conception of what freedom means, which is very different from what an American libertarian uh, has as a conception of the word freedom. Uh, the American libertarian views freedom primarily in terms of uh, freedom for property, whereas the anarchist views often freedom from property, uh, from private property. And uh, if you don't properly define these concepts, the debate won't actually lead to anywhere. Well, as an anarchist, I already disagree with your definition there, but <laughs> that, that I think is part of the point of real political debate, is coming to the understanding of the terms that are being used so that some sort of communication is at least possible. What an intriguing few minutes of conversation that was, wasn't it? Uh, and Andrew raises some very good points. And then, as I say at the end of that clip, well, I don't agree with your definition of anarchism. But that really is the point. That is the point. That if we do not actually have base definitions that we are working from so that we have a common language that we can use to communicate with each other, then we are not communicating with each other. Even if we are using the same words, we are talking past each other and we are not really comprehending what the other is saying and we are not properly expressing ourselves because we do not have a key, a key baseline of definitions from which we can build an actual discourse. And that, again, is it seems very simple, but it is an exceptionally important part of actual communication. And that dovetails very nicely, once again, with Stuart Chase and the tyranny of words. That's a point that he comes back to and demonstrates amply again and again throughout the book. In fact, throughout the book, he, he presents passages of highfalutin talk by politicians and judges and economists and mathematicians and whoever, and then replaces their airy-fairy abstract vague language with no real reference and no real definitions. He replaces all those words with the word blab and then reproduces the same passage. And you see that most of the passage is just blab, 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 because that it ends up becoming the, the, the standard discourse that we're, we're wading through every single day without even really consciously realizing it, because we mistake the words for the things, we hear words, we think we have some sort of idea about what they mean, but we don't have to drill down on them too hard. We don't have to really understand what is being said, because we get the general gist. And that is the exact way that the politicians, for example, can use their euphemisms to cover up all manner of heinous actions, because, again, we hear a term like enemy combatant, oh, okay, so some some military person who was actively fighting against the United States was killed in a drone strike. Okay, well, I, that makes sense. It was a war. Oh, but what if we didn't use that word enemy combatant? What if we said 15-year-old child who happened to be in the crosshairs of an American drone? 
then perhaps that gives a different inflection. But when the press, for example, goes dutifully along with whatever the, uh, the, the, the term of the day is by the Pentagon, dictated by the military, then they start to construct a reality. And that is the prism through which we see reality. Words are this prism that is the only way we have access to a reality. And if they put a certain prism that reflects the light a certain way, then we see that reality in a certain way. And it helps to actually shape the real decisions that we take and the real actions that we take in real life. Profound, profound effects that stem from language. And the word boxes that... Uh, that we use to try to construct our understanding of reality, but can be uh, prisons if we don't really drill down on the details and form just basic definitions for the words that we're using. Um, some very basic points, but some very profoundly important points. So I hope that they do not go over the heads of the audience. I, I have at least given you your homework reading assignment of uh, the tyranny of words, which I think is worth it for people who are interested in this subject and its ramifications. But uh, just to prove I am a man of my word, uh, for the viewers of the video version of this podcast, I will present my credentials. Yes, yes, I did get my BA from the University of Calgary. I did get my MPhil from Trinity College, Dublin. Um, so there you go. I am qualified to speak on such things. And now you can rest assured that I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs> what nonsense. What blab, as Stuart Chase would no doubt interject. All right, well, we're going to leave this heady philosophical and philological conversation there for this week. But I am James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and I am looking forward to talking to you again very shortly. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.